Back in 1997, the Millennium Dome was emerging to become a serious uh, government investment, a significant political gesture, and for the architecture and design community, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to create a unique visitor experience, celebrating our future aspirations in the new millennium. So Land, a fairly new design consultancy formed in 1992, we were invited to competitively bid for two zones within the dome, the faith zone and the play zone. The briefs were thin and the client operational teams inexperienced. And as you will see, they felt able to rigorously interrogate the design process. Our emerging strategy was to acknowledge their needs, but at the same time, follow our natural intuition, our instinct to make most of such an extraordinary opportunity. This video is in three parts. Firstly, it tracks the creative angst actually producing the play zone. It is unusual to have such an in-depth record of the design process. Having established this context, we then provide extensive documentation of the final installations, accrediting collaborators, establishing the complexity of curation and the challenges of the technologies. Finally, we reflect on how our serendipitous introduction to digital media back in 2000 has impacted on the legacy of our work in cultural, commercial and educational domains over the past 20 years. It's May 1997. Britain has just elected a new Prime Minister. New Labour is determined to change the way Britain sees itself. But they need something to help them do it. Blair quickly seizes on the site of a disused gas works in South London and a Tory idea to build a dome. Within weeks, a divided cabinet grudgingly agree to back the risky idea. Tony Blair and three of his leading ministers rush to the site. This is our chance to show the finest exhibition that the world has seen. It's important for a minister to be in charge of actually trying to drive the exhibition part of this through. It's October 1997 and the race is on. The Millennium Dome will be a unique private and public funded initiative. At a cost of £758 million, it'll be paid by sponsors, the National Lottery and ticket sales. To take on the battles and to create the Dome, an organisation is set up, the New Millennium Experience Company, the NMEC. A chief executive for the Dome Company is appointed, Jenny Page. She's overseeing an ever-expanding staff. Eventually, 20,000 people will be involved in bringing this vision of the future to the people of Britain. The idea for a dome has been through many plans since it started under the Tories. Now, it will answer three huge questions. Who we are, where we live, and what we do. Good afternoon. Details have been given about what's to be inside the controversial Millennium Dome at Greenwich in South East London. There will be 12 attractions covering 20 acres and the site will be open to the public on New Year's Eve 1999. At a ceremony setting out the government's vision for the project, the Prime Minister urged people not to be cynical but to see it as a huge asset for Britain. The bandwagon is beginning to roll. The benefits to this country are going to be huge. To make it something that people in this country and right round the world will remember for the rest of their days. It's a pretty bold ambition, but it's a good one, and we're going to make it happen. His audience, sponsors and potential sponsors, who've so far stumped up £75 million, it was announced today, of the organisers' £150 million target. Then it was off to see models of six of the 13 exhibition zones so far planned for the Dome and at last made public. It's truly sort of multimedia really, that's what we're after. But the design team for the serious play zone say the critics are carping. They've enlisted the help of painter Patrick Hughes, a master of illusion. Together they plan to take visitors to the Dome on a high-tech virtual ride. 
visitors will journey along a travelator passing by a whole gallery of optical illusions, holograms and virtual displays. I mean, if we can just make the whole of this piece do that, you know, that's the challenge for us, is just saying that the whole of this movement experience. I'd always been a great fan of Patrick's work, and because it's an optical device, it's an optical trick, what has to happen is you have to move past it. And the idea is that we're trying to devise this as a, as a, as a, as a new medium. And by virtue of actually using those sort of optical tricks, like, like Patrick's trick, we actually take people on this, on this magical ride, really, and ultimately, the object of that magical ride is that we can impart some very clear communication ideas. So at the end of each of those passes, there are, there's a very fixed idea about playing to learn. So, so it's a magical knowledge tour rather than a magical mystery tour. That sounds, sounds okay. Yeah, we'll have that. It's blood. It's blood to make it happen. And we keep on needing intravenous injections and more blood in order to keep us alive. So far, she's squeezed sponsorship from companies like M&S, Ford, and Sky TV. She thinks Sky will be ideally suited to sponsoring the Play Zone about the quirky future of leisure. Peter and Shirley have an award-winning exhibition design company, Land, but their future depends on this job. So Shirley's in charge of the money, and I'm meant to be in charge of the creative, so... She says you can't afford it, and I say, well, we've got to have it. I think Peter's job is far more difficult because he's responsible for the overall look. For Peter, the future of play is about making your own fun. How will his active ideas go down with a company that entertains couch potatoes? Sky are our sponsor. We've not really been introduced to them as yet, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, because I think it's a very exciting sponsor to have. Sky is about to launch digital satellite TV, and its bosses want to use the dome to promote it. It's the dawn of a new age, and Sky as a sponsor feels that it's a company that's on the edge of giving you choice and challenge and entertainment, and it's right there with what we're doing. We assumed that Sky wanted what we designed because we were there before they were. We gradually realised that they had a new product that they wanted to promote, uh, which was Sky Digital. And so we found that difficult because the play zone as it stood didn't suit Sky Digital. Right. Back to square one. Yeah, yeah, square yeah. two. Peter Higgins and Shirley uh, Walker are struggling to redesign the play zone to please Sky TV. People will stop and look at a whole series of spectacular, fairly aspirational activities. Skydiving, sailing. Now they plan to bring the future world of leisure to the British public with lots of big TV screens. Indicated. Where we have TV as a medium, is that just part of the introduction now? Is it all part of the same thing? Yes. It's demonstrating the way your, your window into this play yeah, world, for most people, is, is that watching experience. Before showing their ideas to Sky, they'll have to present them to Jenny's Supreme Council responsible for signing off the content, the Litmus Group. These are really today's diagrams. And it's made up of the great and the good, chaired by Michael Grade, who used to run BBC Television and Channel 4. ...footage in a very, very different way, in a very, very different media. So some of it is virtual, some of it is mirror-reflected, mirror some right. of it is emissive screen -based. But at the end of the day, that's just, a dis that's just a distribution mechanism. It's an awful lot of footage and gawping at moving images. Every time I hear the word projection, I start to worry. The, the, the viewer is so sophisticated today in terms of the angles and, and what, the way they've seen it. You've got, to, you, you've got to be amazing to create something that they haven't seen before. My, that's my concern, is... is but I, I, think, I, think the important, I think that's a very good, a very good point. And the conversation we've developed... The Sky. influence or the impact of Sky on us put us under a lot of pressure and it threatened our credibility with the NMEC. Our credibility like was on the line on TV at home and watching it in the cinema. But your perception of it is yeah, very, very sorry different. Sorry to be really boring, but so what? So what? what what's, you know, what do I get out of that? What? You know, I've seen, I've seen it all from different angle or what, 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 I'm not quite clear what I'm getting here. 
this zone does have a sponsor with a big S, and that sponsor is extremely hands-on, um, very interested, very involved. It's all sort of full body contact, really. Without being quite clear, you've got a 3D commercial for the sponsor. Uh, and, and one of the things I would have thought we're going to need to be sensitive about is the degree to which we have allowed that. It's still not clear to me what, the pro what your proposition is at all. Uh, I hope there's some humour in it somewhere along the way, because, uh, you know, play does suggest some fun. What the litmus group is saying to you is, this is, you know, this is form without function, frankly. Yeah, all, exactly. all our job is is to increase to the agony yeah. so that you focus down on it. I look forward to seeing the next <laughs> next version, but I think you've got a long, long way to go with this one. A long way. Peter and Shirley are told to go and think again. The next one is... Um, it was a real muddle, actually, to be honest. Right from the beginning, we didn't have a clue, really, what we were trying to do or trying to achieve. We didn't understand what their brief was. They didn't really write a brief for us. We had nothing really tangible ever to respond to. The next day, Peter and Shirley's careers are in the balance. They've refined their ideas for the play zone. With time running out, they have to get this approved by Sky and the NMEC together. Today, we've put a presentation together which we've had about 15 or 16 working days on, and it's incredibly important because the sponsors are waiting to see something that they have to be impressed by. It's kind of make or break today, I guess. Everything was wrong. Peter thinks he's got a winning idea. The first time we felt we were onto something, that we just got the essence of this idea of digital play. When you hold me near, clouds all disappear. So on the ramp up, we've got objects actually floating past on a conveyor belt, past a flat screen, and we're going to analyse these objects, objects of play. And then once at the top of the ramp, you enter this playscape and you're given a surfball. Um, it's almost like a token, like a kind of very smart token, really. Rainbow. In Peter's desperate attempts to please Sky, he's invented a digital playground packed with new age arcade games. The first person to speak was Jenny and then Claire and Ben. Everybody really, really hooked into what we were proposing. They understood it, they were excited by it. They were with us and we were, for the first time, running together on something. It was an amazing meeting, wasn't it? Mm. Everybody really enjoyed it and appreciated what we'd done, apart from the lady from Sky. And she just said, I don't get it. It's still not the brand promotion that Sky wants. And, um, Sky, rapidly after the presentation, shifted sideways and, and found another zone. Peter and Shirley carry on without a sponsor. They will spend another year designing and redesigning the play zone. As the politics rolled on and Charlie Faulkner replaced Peter Mandelson as major stakeholder, our approach to the design of the play zone changed dramatically for three reasons. Through sheer serendipity, we had culled the word digital from our involvement with Sky TV and speculated whether this may impact on how we would all play in the future. It was, of course, a prescient moment, ultimately to be played out by the whole world of entertainment and the emergence of big tech uh, as, as we know it today. Another turning point was encouraged by a chance meeting with Gerfried Stocker, now a good friend and an eminent new technologist expert and director of Ars Electronica in Linz in Austria, a centre that has been um, involved in digital technology since 1979. In his typical open source mode, he shared his contacts and supported the central development of our initiative. The third part of our jigsaw was the unnerving support of Dome CEO Jenny Page. It was now without a sponsor that we were to be funded by the NMEC, who were being presented by us with emerging technologies and concepts of the future. A difficult thing to sell in to an anxious client under massive government and media scrutiny. Over this year of R&D, we had to take on a huge raft of responsibilities to design an architectural mechanism that could contain and distribute up to 30,000 visitors a day and provide a clever way to embed and control a wide range of technologies, 
also to coordinate an extensive team including project managers, quantity surveyors, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, IP lawyers, but most importantly curate a wide range of digital installations that were technically deliverable and would satisfy our diverse and critical audience. We travelled the world and would have to deliver a visitor experience presenting a prototype of future play. Less than two weeks after Mandelson's resignation, a replacement minister is found. Lord Falconer was recently ennobled by his old friend, Tony Blair, and made minister. Now, like Mandelson, he will also be the Dome's single shareholder and lead the dream. It's the first one I've ever done. Um, and this morning, um, the mood looked very, very enthusiastic. After a year and a half of arguing and redesigning, Jenny and her dome company have eventually approved the zone. Its designers, Peter Higgins and Shirley Walker, think they are off the hook. Stones, didn't they? Shirley's forced me into having some holiday. But it is typical that we booked a holiday in Cornwall and we have to come and see modular mouldings in Cornwall. <laughs> and I just wonder if you plan that. Their zone will contain a world of digital play on huge screens. They'll be housed in huge fiberglass cones already being made by a Cornish boat builder. Oh, right. So this is one that we're actually going to use? Yes. Oh, right. yeah. A wall of cones will house the New Age computer games which are already being programmed around the world. Back in their London office, they are having other things to worry about. Just when they think everything is under control, Lord Falconer wants to see their ideas. We've gone so far down the line, we're at the point, way beyond the point of no return. So it's not as if he can have a lot to do or change things. Because we're past that point now. Mm. He'll have to like it. It is too late, we've placed all the orders, it's all happening. <laughs> the chequebook has been opened. But the man at the top is worried that the dome might be too serious. If you have a zone called play, children and their families are going to think, ooh, let's go to play for the children. It seems to be very important, therefore, that it be really entertaining. I think all we're doing this afternoon is just making sure that he understands it, he's happy with it, that he reports good things back to Tony Blair. Very nice to meet you. Fingers yeah. crossed. And you want my telly? Yes. It's an incredibly clever system. If you can Peter imagine, shows off some musical system. games he's found, like an electronic piano. It strikes the keys and then sends a shard of light up into the air. And at the same time, there's a great deal of whoosh. And you make, yeah. you make a light show. In fact, you make a light show right. which dominates your so space. There's not a game as such. No, not as such. These are insect cocoons. There's also moths so flying to a torch simple, and a singing harp. These aren't shoot em up games. There's an anxiety about that, obviously. But what we need to do is to move on, because some of the yeah. others, like the, sure. the soccer okay. game, actually yeah. have got more pace yeah. to them. Right. Digital goalkeeper, armchair nice. goalkeeper. What you've always wanted to do is to be in goal against Alan Shearer, but you're a granny and you can never do it. But you can with this game. How many armchair goalies are there going to be? Well, there's a chance of being a goalkeeper or... Um, you be a kicker or a kicker, goalkeeper. Yeah, and you just, you're very quick. Not I'm, not, I'm not advocating... I can't want you to shoot them up, as how you no. described them, which is very, very attractive to children. Mm. But these games, as you have described them, seem tame. You are not doing the things which, as it were, five to 15-year-olds would find attractive in relation to play at the moment. I think I mean, you you, I mean, and you're, 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 some of them, some of them they will, you know. It isn't a case of pushing the kids into some activity and walking away, having a cup of tea and coming that will back. Be, that will be, uh, it's very difficult. That will be the temptation, quite legitimately, of quite a lot of um, uh, parents, I can tell you. So but they won't you go, be well, why not? Well, because, first of all, it's, not it's, forbidden. it's so interesting to actually but watch you know, they don't get to it, because they say, on. you go to play and I'm going to go and satisfy myself in the faith zone or whatever. The 11 to 15 year old yeah. boy particularly, what's his take going to be on the play zone? It is too museum-y type play mm, rather yeah, than play type play. It's play, it's intended to be for children, mm. is it not? Bye bye, bye bye, bye bye, nice to meet you. Imagine yourself, Jenny, if you will, with five children who have been in the mm -hmm. dome for three hours watching a harp. That they would not find as exciting as watching mm -hmm. extracts of Doctor Who. No, no, I understand that. I think that what they've got are things that are sufficiently new mm -hmm. 
actually to attract that other bit of children, particularly the sort of the 8 to 13 range, which is I've done something which you haven't done. You want to make it what children think is fun. I think he's right to question the, ultimately the overall way the dome's working in terms of its understanding its audience, its tabloid rather than its broadsheet approach. And I think we've all been misdirected on that particular audience. I think we've been identified as a, as a zone that can change that because other zones aren't as much fun as they could be. Ours is meant to be extraordinary fun and in yeah. his eyes it's meant to be for yeah, it children. Will be. It will be. We have to believe that when he arrives he'll think it is as fun as he wants it to be. So we left Peter Higgins is called in unexpectedly to another meeting at Dome headquarters because of the minister's worry. In a final attempt to appease the minister, Jenny invites her advisor, Michael Grade, Showtime. the ex-boss of BBC and Channel 4, to see what he thinks and if he has any bright ideas. It was the bit that was looking deadly boring mm -hmm. last time we looked at it with Lord Faulkner. So you see <coughs> six objects on the way in that are built in an unusual way. There's um, a mobile of flying objects. There's a pop-up book with a beanstalk coming out of it. Then there's um, a harp and then there's two people watching TV. Now, on the way out, by using the half-silvered mirror, we have a little digital cyclist riding round the inside rim of that bicycle. Beanstalk is now complete with digital jack climbing up the beanstalk. Yeah. The harp suddenly comes to life and starts singing. Uh, just to give you a context, the concern is that the balance may be too far towards the older, more cerebral, or aesthetic than the, than the instant thrill. That's kind of the accusation that's hanging in the air that we have to deal with. You know, I have terrible ideas sometimes. What if information on those screens related to games inside the so-and-so machine, record score, 3 million four hundred and twenty. current player. Mm. We've got people building these things. Yeah. Can't start changing things now, it's July. We've got to deliver this thing in October. It's a, if you're going up the escalator and you see yourself coming down, in other words, yeah, I don't, I know. You know, I know. do you see sort of, what sort of I'm saying? Mm -hmm. you, see, you, look, you suddenly see yourself going down, you see, and of course the head, it's because it's real time, the head turns. Yeah. It's a simple idea with God knows what's behind how you I do it. I think he can put his finger on kind of entertainment aspects of what we're doing. 100 grand for a 30 second experience, Michael? I think not. I'm not a bugger. <laughs> they all listened. I didn't have a tantrum, no. No, there was no need. It just, we just, what we said is that we'd never had the material with uh, Charlie Faulkner and that was the mistake. I would want to go, I mean, my test is, would I want to go in there would, you know, would, kids? would my kid, my kids are 27 months, 25 and 29, so I'm not quite sure that I'm your uh, archetypal family, but uh, I think they would, yes. Michael Gray came up with some uh, fairly um, extraordinary mad ideas, but I think we're off the hook. Okay. For two years, the play zone has been fought over by sponsors and ministers and even moved upstairs to accommodate shots. As a result, its designers, Peter Higgins and Shirley Walker, are wrestling with an empty shell. It's just bad luck. It's just the whole project is so tight that there isn't room for contingency. Until their building is completely enclosed, they can't start installing their delicate electronics. Minister in charge, Lord Falconer, argued that their design wouldn't be fun enough. Its designer, Peter Higgins, is about to meet Charlie Falconer again. I think Charlie was worried about the fact that um, he really did think it was just, the place should just be for teenagers. And we were adamant that it shouldn't be. And there was a big kind of um, 
difference in opinion. Um, and it was very difficult, you know, he was very fixed in that view. Um, and I think he was wrong, I think he was really wrong. On the 2nd of December, Charlie Falconer comes down to see how the play zone is getting on. How are you? Nice to see you. Yeah, and you. Great. Welcome. Thank you very much Welcome indeed. Welcome to a park finished line. Uh, uh, he takes on a uh, delicate ballerina yeah. in a tug of war uh, uh, and wins. Right. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. <laughs> now, what we can do is Karen can move she around. Moves, There's a sofa for smooching with someone at the other end of the zone. The cushions make heads disappear, so the minister tries his head on a lady's body. <laughs> Our bodies are such different shapes. <laughs> it's great fun. That is great fun, yes. And it really makes people, strangers, interact with one another. It does, yeah, it does. Now, with just four days to the grand opening, Peter Mandelson takes a quick break from Northern Ireland. He is finally ready to face the old ghosts. Peter! Is it Peter? Peter! We're all trying to get in. <laughs> I'm fine, how are you? It's safe. Thank you. Uh, how do you do? We nearly met one. <laughs> 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 You've stolen one of Jenny's eyes. There's your eyes. That's your eyes. Right there, right there. That's a good Cross my eyes. Come on. Come Where's my mouth? That's it. Oh, yeah. Ah, you see, that's the end of the game. <laughs> but Jenny was ahead on points, I think. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey. oh, that's it, yeah. Very good. Hey, oh, get off my lap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, simple pleasure. <laughs> The play zone was a success, voted the best zone in the dome and consistently received the plaudits of the press. It's November and dome baby Louis is one year old. Peter and Shirley are going for a night out. Their play zone has been nominated for the best entertainment venue in the world. Tension building. Right, the winner is the play zone, Millennium Dome. Please come to the stage, Peter Higgins, Robert Clark, Shirley Walker, and James Dibble from Land. Well done. The judges want to show that the quality of imagination is sadly rarely found in the dome. As I explained before, many of our global installations were attributed to support from Gerfried Stocker from Ars Electronica. Others were co-curated or devised by ourselves or simply drawn from local UK media artists. We devised a set of convenient criteria to help organise the selection. These were play to discover, play to learn and play to express. We also set out performance specifications that defines such issues as interaction modes, engagement prompts, protocols, and numbers of players, um, and also, very importantly, dwell time. A revelation that has continued to inform our work was the concept of passive interactivity, where non-participants could enjoy the activities 
as long as they understood the inputs and output protocols and the output media was at a suitably large scale. In parallel with the selection of games, we were creating the architectural mechanism which would incorporate a significant array of back projection screens contained within these snouts. Also a fluid movement system that would be able to accommodate up to 33,000 visitors a day. 13 games were located around the perimeter incorporating responsive large back projection screens. One rather poetic piece had its own space and a 100 person multi-user auditorium was positioned by the exit in order to evacuate such large numbers effectively. The centre space literally contained three quite physical games. By taking visitors on an escalator to an upper level, we were able to bring them down a ramp that provided an intriguing overview of most of the activities. This acted as a pre-show, providing visitors with a sense of the range of installations that were down below. Once at the lower level, they were free to sit on benches and informally wait their turn. To facilitate the large visitor numbers, the games would time out. We introduced the video of installations with Kids Room. It's an advanced interactive gaming environment, which we've been introduced to at MIT and then seen in its experimental form at a US media festival called Seagraph. We approached Nearlife, a startup based in Cambridge, Boston, who were the developers and then undertook a collaborative process to reformat and stabilize a narrative that would suit a UK audience. We start by presenting some R&D and then a clip from BBC's Tomorrow's World. This may look like any ordinary children's playroom, but in fact, it's a giant interactive storybook. We enter a room dominated by huge colorful screens which serve as two of the walls. A mysterious voice tells us to go on a journey in search of a magic word. Kids, come in. Do you want to know the magic word? Yes. If you want the magic word, go and knock on that cupboard. Go on. Don't bother me for the magic word. I don't know what it is. Hey kids, come over here. I'll help you. Right, jump up as high as you can and I'll give you a clue. Initially, the screen just provides a background while the furniture beckons the children to and fro. It feels like someone is hiding behind the walls watching us and controlling our every move. But in fact, there's no human guide leading us on this treasure hunt. It's actually the world's first interactive playroom controlled by a combination of camera and computer. There's several different parts to the kids' room. The, the first part is the a camera, which is up in the ceiling and uh, looks down upon the kids. And it's just a regular infrared security camera that watches where the kids move and how they move through the space. And from that, the computer can process that image and create these kind of blobs that move around the space and know exactly where the kids are at any point in time. Although the room is quite dark, it's actually flooded with invisible infrared light. The camera has an infrared filter so it can distinguish hot things like children from cold things like the furniture. Anything hot shows up as a white blob that the computer then tracks by comparing one picture frame with the previous one. So the children's progress through the story is monitored by the computer and it's their actions which influence the events that unfold. In addition to being able to tell what position they're in, we also can tell whether they're moving or not. Um, for example, when, the, when they're asked to spin or jump up and down, we can tell if they're spinning and that, or spinning enough and ask them to jump higher or, or spin faster. Higher. If the kids don't do what they're supposed to do, the computer tells the furniture to start nagging them. Higher. The most dramatic phase of the game begins when on the huge screens in front of us, the walls of the room dissolve and turn into a raging river. Now the bed is a raft and it's up to us to stay afloat. We steer the bed by paddling on either side, the computer picking up our every move. 
when the kids are on the bed, we can know if they're paddling on the left or the right, because we can look for movement there. And they can actually steer the boat to the left side of the river, to the right side of the river, and steer it away from the rocks or towards the rocks. The combination of the huge screen, the darkness, and the way the image responds to our actions really makes us feel as if we're paddling for our lives. If one of the kids gets off the bed, an old man's voice yells, man overboard, and orders them back on. Our journey continues into the jungle with dancing monkeys which follow us along the walls. But what did our young test audience make of this 21st century entertainment? I like to look the whole thing. I like that birds and I like all the monkeys. I like everything talking and all the parrots and the big screen and all the, all the pictures and everything else. Um, yeah, I was fortunate to be asked to create the digital visual communication media for the Play Zone experience, to dovetail into an incredible group of digital media artists and designers led by Peter Higgins' vision of the future of play. To put some context on the tech aspects at the time, for the post-production we principally used a very early Premiere-based system called Video Vision with just four gigabytes of storage, so it was pretty slow to, to say the least. Screen ratio was still 4.3, so no HD yet. Resolution was state-of-the-art uh, VGA 1024768 pixels, largely created on and driven by the just-released, more ergonomic-looking Blue Power Mac G3s. Touchscreens, still a rarity, were ugly, bulbous CRT-type monitors. The iPhone and Facebook didn't appear for at least another decade. However, what was going on behind the games was incredibly sophisticated for the time, genuinely ahead of the time. There was a lot of incredible raw coding happening and even silicon graphic computing, producing some very seamless and quite magical digital experiences, which appealed to both children and adults alike. Um, we actually went back in and about three months after it opened to video document it live, and it was seriously buzzing. camera captures the movement of a player and software transforms the image into a large-scale kaleidoscopic effect enhanced by a MIDI sound system. This compelling way of interactive media making was later to be discovered by a special needs school when visiting the play zone. This game was for all ages and strengths. Players were able to select the power of an opponent based on their visual appearance. There were some surprises. The force feedback technology presented an uncannily responsive system which challenged the players to pull the character towards them and eventually out of the screen. A surrogate armchair goalie sat behind a half-sized goal. The task was to watch the striker through the goal and anticipate the flight of a penalty. By using a touch-sensitive screen, the player chooses one of five positions for the goalie to dive. A virtual digital goalie appears and either saves or misses the ball. We took this proprietary game of Batak and put a spin on it by making it a see-through double-sided and consequently a game for two. It tested reaction and stamina. One of two pieces by eminent media artist Toshio Iwai. A trackball sends light pulses up a tilted horizontal screen, which then physically strike the keys of a grand piano. The output of sound and light is mesmerising. Skilled pianists can of course manipulate the sound and light show. Toshio's other installation is a gridded table containing 36 buttons that play a note when struck. Whilst the grid represents a note, instruments are represented by projected arrows. By directing the arrows, up to four players may select the paths of an instrument through the grid of notes, thus creating a fascinating collective tune. 
This is a simulation of a familiar handheld puzzle. A 3D model of a maze is projected onto a camera-driven interactive floor with a pivot point centre. The model tilts seemingly under the weight of the players according to where they stand. As the projected surface tilts, a steel ball moves through the maze and appears to obey the laws of gravity. The torch interface activates virtual insects from within cocoons and creates swarms. They need light to survive, and the player is effectively controlling the life cycle of these virtual insects. The faces of two players were captured on the large back projection screen. These complete views were fragmented into a jumble of jigsaw pieces on the upper part of the screen and were maintained as live moving image. The players competed to reassemble their own faces. This uses an exercise bicycle as an interface to activate an info tour around the zones within the dome. A 3D computer model of the dome was projected onto the screen in front of the player, who was able to cycle through the structures. They were also able to tilt left and right to enter the individual zones and activate imagery relating to the content. The player sat at a table and was able to activate a virtual projected book using a light sensitive pen. Magical things occurred, a virtual apple is eaten, a virtual handle in the book opens a virtual door, and a virtual light switch turns on a real light. This telematic installation involved two similar setups located in different parts of the play zone, though they could be anywhere in the world. Using blue screen technology, people were able to view themselves interacting with one another. They start to explore three-dimensional space and enjoy the ability to superimpose their bodies. Players were able to view a database of on-screen kisses made by other visitors. It's a very early selfie. They were then invited to add a kiss to the database and make a choice of who they wanted to kiss. A celebrity participant could make their dreams come true. This was an interactive game for a hundred people set within an auditorium. Visitors were given a double-sided paddle, red on one side, green on the other. They were then divided into two teams to play a massive game of Pong with the objective of saving the cats from the dogs. The camera recognises the collective matrix of red and green pixels, which can then move a fence up or down on either side of the central screen. Each team had to try and protect the cat from an aggressive dog. The exit sequence complemented the entrance sequence by actively digitising sculptural objects that were carefully devised to reflect our three modes of play. This exit journey speculated on the future of play and how it would be affected by digital technology. So it actually completed the narrative of our zone. As creative design practitioners, the potential of digital technologies has lived with us way beyond the closure of the dome at the end of 2000. Initially, it was to inform our work in the cultural sector, especially lottery funded projects, and later working with national museums such as the Natural History Museum, the VNA, and the British Museum. Also, we were able to introduce these emerging technologies to our commercial clients in order to augment their brand experiences and even to embed them into educational initiatives which provided valuable learning tools for children. It's over to you now. Take on the role of a scientist as you look for answers to the big questions. Additionally, it is rewarding to work with design students at such institutions as the Royal College of Art or Central St Martins and share our journey of discovery with a generation of digerati, 
that were not even born when we conceived the play zone. An immediate transferal of technology in the play zone happened a couple of months before we closed and involved the kaleidoscope. Here is a BBC News item. Staff at Chad's Road School at Catshill Bronsgrove say the results are remarkable. It's just a fabulous piece of equipment. Um, the children can do so many amazing and exciting things on there. Even the children with most physical, profound physical disabilities can make the whole screen come alive. The school encountered Kaleidoscope on a visit to the day. The equipment impressed them so much, they decided to write and ask for it. We'd always been pleased with the effect of the wraparound large-scale screen and the contemporary ambience of the blazer. It was likened by a Guardian journalist to an Ibethan night. Here, with the unenviable task of presenting the future, it can only ever really be the history of the future. A big idea was to create a walk-in website. It was as if live streaming immersive data was surrounding the visitor, but the ability to create a link using a foreground screen inspired by a tangible displayed object, providing three layers of engagement. For example, high resolution images of the tongue as the pill is being swallowed. This project probably owed something to the immersive environment in Kids Room. In the spirit of the Abbott Mead Vickers annual Christmas campaign for Grouse Whiskey, we wanted to create a surrealistic interactive environment where magical things could happen. Themes from whiskey drinking, splash of water, cracks of ice, gave us clues to be exploited. Unlike Kids Room or Maze, here we use both infrared and seismic sensors to track the movement of visitors, with overhead projection contained within the pitch roof of the structure. The installation could accommodate up to 10 people at any one time and received several design and marketing awards, including an interactive BAFTA. By reflecting on the influence that cities had had on the work of the created community of writers, artists, photographers, illustrators, filmmakers, we created new imaginary cities, not only terrestrial but in space or even floating on water. Visitors were able to scroll through selected themes and the creative work projected onto a horizontal conductive surface. The output words or images were then transferred to an overhead frieze where they morphed into futuristic architectural forms, augmented with a powerful soundscape. Here we have adopted a gaming paradigm where visitors navigate their way through a wireframe representation of 19th century streets of Swansea to find a house dedicated to a historic personality. Once inside the house, real objects appear, which are also located in a protected glass case. These may also be seen through the suspended translucent holopro screen. This multi-user interface with active projection allows visitors to scroll across and investigate the industrial archaeology set around the environs of Swansea. Hotspots may be identified and narratives loaded onto the foreground screen. Tabletop cases display associated objects. This installation self-references our work for the Futures Gallery. This pavilion responded to the expo theme of nature's wisdom. We invited the Natural History Museum to join our team and researched examples of British innovation that had directly referenced the natural world. 
We are able to entertain up to 33,000 visitors per day by creating very simple intuitive installations that would encourage fast track free flow. Lessons were learned from the Blazone in how to facilitate passive interactivity. Sticky hairs of the gecko have inspired the development of medical tape. Here, Gecko Man is activated by a mechanical puppet and climbs the gherkin. The virtual page turner, as used in the Playzone, shows visitors how Japanese seeds have been stored in Kew Gardens Millennium Seed Bank. Another rotating interface, an orrery, is in fact a semiotic system with the handle, the moon, moving around the earth demonstrates the potential of tidal energy being installed in harbours and estuaries of the UK. Hello London! This is the British Music Experience. Back at the Millennium Dome, now the O2, and nine years on, this experience describes the history of British popular music. One feature were the digital timelines which define musical periods. Visitors could investigate moments in time using our now familiar large dynamic interactive projection surface. Other media devices were invented such as table talk where personalities could enter into a conversation based on a theme or a simple question augmented with the tabletop projection which we had first used in the play zone. The biggest challenge was to make the experience cross-generational which was enabled by providing semantic layers of data wherever possible. By, by a Prime Minister who wasn't really that caring. In a few minutes, you'll be taking a unique journey through the challenges... Located in a new library, we were able to convince the big lottery fund that this media-rich prototype of informal education could support teachers to communicate life issues embedded in PSHE, personal, social health and economic education, always a difficult part of the curriculum for years six and years eight. Difficult themes could be played out in this 90 minute immersive experience. The children leave with information and contacts should they need support or help. Come on, give it back. What are you going to do about it? I've heard about this girl. That's why my friend told me to carry a knife. Well, maybe I should just run and get help. Table to be with a family having their evening meal. Enough! No more excuses! <laughs> it's not your fault. Don't cry. Mum's just upset because Dad's angry. This 20 minute experience, a compelling example of digital theatre, is located in a listed 18th century dockyard building. The victory. And she started in this very room. This is a mold loft. Look upon this floor. We take the plans for each ship that we construct and draw them upon this floor piece by piece at exactly the same size as the final pieces of the ship will be. And then, from thin, light pieces of wood, using the lines we've drawn, we make what is called a mold or a pattern or a template. And that mold is taken down to the building slip or the dry dock where we use it to guide as we make the frame of the ship in proper, heavy timber. The Milan Expo in 2015 attracted 21 million visitors and had a theme of feeding the planet energy for life. The sinuous UAE pavilion was designed by Foster and Partners. The entrance ramp created an immersive vertical space within which we installed arrays of glass fins that contained bespoke media cubes combining 3D kinetic models with augmented video effects. The expo theme of food and energy was a challenge. We devised 24 media installations to help demystify complex narratives. 
Here you can see the theme of camel's milk, a highly nutritious product being produced in the UAE. And with this, we demonstrate the development of desert algae that has the potential to be converted into jet fuel. Visitors were also able to engage with the cubes using mobile phones and tablets. Two other themes include the use of reef balls and the historic management of water irrigation through the use of the foulage. The overall 45 minute experience of the pavilion attracted 1.2 million visitors and was considered to be in the top three most popular pavilions. These digital technologies demonstrated within our legacy work are now in 2020, of course, ubiquitous. They're in museums, brand experiences, retail, leisure, even in our homes. But it would be false modesty not to claim some sort of influence or inspiration for others that may have referenced our work and the curated work of our collaborators in the play zone. Back in 1997, the brief from our client was to create an experience in the Millennium Dome that may anticipate how we will all play in the future. We believe that it is only now, and reflecting on the digital world around us, we can genuinely claim that this is what we delivered. <laughs>